Pastos Biology Topics from the Study Guide In order to understand the nervous system, it's helpful to have some idea of the embryonic development of the nervous system. I often begin an organ system with a little bit of information about its embryonic development. We'll look at figure 9-3 for that. Let's consider a very early human embryo. The embryo might look like this. Here's the head end. It's bigger than the posterior end. It looks like this. Let's slice it in half and let's look at a cross-section view of the embryo. If we do that, we see a diagram like this. This is page 9.7, figure 9-3. This is the end view of the early embryo. Now the outer embryonic tissue is called ectoderm, and on the dorsal side, the back side of the embryo, arising from neural ectoderm, is a plate of cells called the neural plate. Very quickly after that forms, it begins to fold in the middle. Uh, the fold is called the neural groove, and the edges of it, the neural folds. As time goes by, the neural fold rolls into a tube called the neural tube, and it becomes covered with outer ectoderm. So it sinks slightly into the embryo. Extending along either side of the lower edge of the neural tube are the neural crest areas. These are segmented areas extending from front to back. Now remember, you're looking at an end view. If we enlarge the neural tube and the neural crest, we see this. Here's the neural tube. Here's one of the neural crest regions. Within the central nervous system, neurons develop which are totally inside the central nervous system. We call these interneurons. Now before we proceed any further, notice the way I diagram a neuron. A circle represents the cell body and the arrowhead represents the tip of the axon. So this rep shows you the direction of conduction of the nerve impulse. Other neurons from the neural tube begin to grow outward and eventually reach the muscles. These are motor neurons. And finally, some neurons develop in the uh, neural crest and they send extensions into the neural tube and in the other direction to the senses. The formation of the neural tube is not as complicated as it seems. Let's pretend this piece of paper is the neural plate on the back side, the dorsal side of the embryo. Here's what it looks like from end view. Now, as, em as the embryo grows, the neural plate begins to fold in the middle, like this, and then roll into a tube, like this. So if you look at it from end view, the neural tube has formed. Now when the neural tube forms, it closes in the middle first, but the ends are still open. All right, there's one. The ends are still open. Eventually, after, say, 25 days following fertilization of the egg, the neural tube closes completely. Notice that your central nervous system, and that's what the neural tube has become, is hollow. As I say in class, I won't make any joke, jokes about how hollow your brain is, but it is hollow. We'll understand this more in the second part of the nervous system. By the way, one of the most common forms of birth defects results from failure of the neural tube to close. If the posterior end fails to close, we call the condition spina bifida. And there are many different degrees of spina bifida. And the reason for that is, in embryonic development, an extremely complex process, one process has to happen first before the next one can happen. And the first process will stimulate the occurrence of the next. So if the neural tube fails to close, 
This then results in a failure of the overlying connective tissue and muscle to form. This in turn leads to a failure of skin to form. A baby may be born with a slight dimple or a depression at the base of the spinal cord or a very large severe hole in the base of the spinal cord. What if the anterior end of the neural tube fails to close? Well, this condition is called anencephaly. An coming from, comes from A, meaning without, and encephaly means what? Brain. So, the offspring is essentially born without a brain. Sometimes you hear about a baby born without a brain. It may live for a little while, but not for long. And you may wonder, how in the world can that happen? Well, it depends on the degree of anencephaly. If part of the medulla, and you'll hear more about this shortly, functions, the offspring can survive for a short while. Let's look at the neural tube from side view. Here's a very early view of the anterior, the front end of the neural tube. As time goes by, the front end begins to enlarge greatly. At first, it develops three major enlargements or bumps. The first one is called the prosencephalon. Remember, pro means first, and we just saw encephalon refers to the brain. The middle one is called the mesencephalon, and the third one, oddly enough, is called the rhombencephalon, and rhomb means shaped like a kite. Why, I'm not sure. At any rate, these three parts of the brain then continue to grow very rapidly. Eventually, the prosencephalon develops into two parts, the telencephalon, and in between the two lobes of the telencephalon, the diencephalon. The mesencephalon stays essentially the same, but the rhombencephalon subdivides into a metencephalon and a myelencephalon. Now these names are not as difficult to remember as they seem. Remember telophase in mitosis. Tel means the end, so this is the end brain. Di means between, so the diencephalon is between the two parts of the telencephalon. Met means after, so the metencephalon is after the previous structures. Myelin refers to a fatty substance as you find in the bone marrow, and so the myelencephalon is closest to the spinal cord, which also gives the appearance of a fatty material. This outline shows the development of the embryonic brain. Prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon subdivide into the parts we just mentioned, and each of those parts then eventually becomes one of the major parts of the brain.